it's very common to connect filters in series or in cascade. Now one of the things that you can do with such a combination is implement a very simple notch filter. A notch filter removes a particular frequency from the input signal. The objectives of this video are to look at series and cascade connections of filters, what that means for impulse response and frequency response, consider some examples of filters in cascade, and then learn how to design a very simple notch filter using this cascade principle. So in this picture, we're depicting an input X of N coming into a filter or system H1, and the output of that is W of N, and then that's applied to a filter or system H2 to produce a final output Y of N. So these two systems, H1 and H2, are connected in series or in cascade. We can find the impulse response of the cascade connection by applying an impulse as the input for x of n. So when we set x of n equal to delta of n, by definition the output of h1 is the impulse response h1 of n. So w of n is h1 of n. And to find the impulse response of the overall cascade, we have to see how W of n propagates through H2 to finally obtain the output Y of n. And since the input was an impulse, Y of n will be the impulse response of the cascade. So Y of n is the convolution of the impulse response of H2 with the input W of n. And we're using this star to denote convolution in compact form. Since W of n is just the impulse response of the first system, H1 of n, I can write Y of n as H2 convolved with H1 of n. And because the input, X of n, is an impulse, this output reflects the impulse response of the overall system. So the impulse response, H of n, is the convolution of the impulse responses of the two systems in cascade, and I can write that as a sum from k equals 0 to m2, h2 of k, h1 of n minus k. Now finding the frequency response of the cascade is a little bit simpler. In this case, we set x of n equal to e to the j 2 pi f hat n. We apply a complex sinusoid, and because these are linear time invariant systems, the output when the input is a complex sinusoid is just the product of the input times the frequency response of the system. So W of n is H1 of f hat times the input complex sinusoid. The same principle applies for H2. So Y of n is going to be the frequency response H2 of f hat times the input W of n, which was H1 of f hat times e to the j 2 pi f hat n. Therefore, we can see that the frequency response of the cascade connection is just the product of the two individual frequency responses. And this is a very intuitive and easy to visualize result. The frequency response of a system consisting of a cascade combination is the product of the individual system frequency responses. So we'll consider the cascade combination of an averaging system which computes its output W as the average of the two most recent inputs, and a differencing system which computes its output as the difference of the two most recent inputs. So the impulse response for H1 applying delta of n for x of n, we find that it's just one half delta of n plus one half delta of n minus one, as shown in the graph here. Similarly, the differencing system has impulse response 1 half delta of n minus 1 half delta of n minus 1. So in this case, the impulse response is values uh, 1 half at n equals 0 and minus 1 half at n equals 1, and it's 0 elsewhere. So to find the impulse response of the cascade of these two systems, we're going to take the output of the first system, which is h1 of n, and we'll apply that as the input to the second system. So we're going to replace W of n with H1 of n, and that by definition will be the impulse response of the cascade combination. Substituting for H1 of n and simplifying this equation, we find that H of n is one-fourth delta of n minus one-fourth delta of n minus two. So the frequency response is the product of the frequency responses of each system, and we have h1 of f hat is 1 half plus 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi f hat, 
whereas the second system, H2, has frequency response 1 half minus 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi f hat. You can multiply these two terms out by foiling the various components, and you find that the result is 1 fourth minus 1 fourth e to the minus j 4 pi f hat. And this is consistent with the impulse response that we found. If we factor out e to the minus j 2 pi f hat, and a j from this expression, you can write this as j over 2 e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times the sine of 2 pi f hat. And this makes it easy to see that the frequency response magnitude is 1 half times the magnitude of the sine. So the frequency response magnitude is 0 when f hat is 0. It's also 0 when f hat is equal to 1 half or minus 1 half and has a peak value of 1 half when f hat is equal to 1 quarter. So we'll look at this a little bit further. The frequency response of the first system can be written in the form e to the minus j pi f hat cosine pi f hat. We've done this previously. Similarly, we previously wrote the frequency response of the second system, the differencing system, as j e to the minus j pi f hat sine of pi f hat. So graphing the frequency response of the averaging system we see that it emphasizes low frequency or zero frequency components and attenuates high frequency components. In contrast, the differencing system attenuates low frequency components and passes high frequency components. Cascade combination of these two is the product of these individual frequency responses. And we can write that out using the full definition for the magnitude and phase and we have that h of f hat is j e to the minus j 2 pi f hat cosine of pi f hat times sine of pi f hat. Well, using a trig identity on the product of the cosine and the sine, we obtain that that's identical to sine of 2 pi f hat over 2. So the magnitude of h of f hat is as we drew on the previous page. And we can see that because h2 is 0 at f hat equals 0, that the product is going to be 0 when f hat is 0. Similarly, h1 is 0 when f hat is near 1 half and minus 1 half, so the product is 0 near f hat equals 1 half and minus 1 half. 0 times any number is going to give you 0. And at minus a quarter and plus a quarter, we have the peak gain because in this case we've got the square root of 2 over 2 times the square root of 2 over 2, and that gives us 1 half. So H1 of f hat, the averaging system, was a low pass filter because it tended to pass low frequencies unchanged and it would attenuate the high frequencies, whereas H2 was a high-pass filter because it tended to attenuate the low frequencies and would pass the higher frequencies. If I take the product of these two and I scale it by 2, then I'll have a band-pass filter because I will be passing frequencies in the vicinity of 1 fourth without changing their magnitude, and I will be attenuating frequencies near 0 and near 1 half and minus a half. So the cascade combination of these two systems has the effect of passing frequencies in a particular band. Now the general problem of FIR filter design is to find an impulse response or the coefficients of the equation relating the input to the output in order to obtain some desired frequency response. We've got three examples here and in general we're going to want to be able to generate more complicated designs and responses and that's the general problem of FIR filter design. Now let's use the ideas that we've generated already to see if it's possible to design what's called a notch filter. What a notch filter does is it blocks a specific frequency and let's assume that our goal is to block frequency plus or minus f hat sub b. Since we're interested in real valued sinusoids, in order to block those, we're going to have to block both the positive frequency component and the negative frequency component. We'll begin by considering a simple system H1 that computes its output as e to the minus j 2 pi f hat b times x of n minus x of n minus 1. We can find the frequency response of this system by putting in e to the j 2 pi f hat for x of n 
and solving for h1 of f hat, and you find that it's e to the minus j 2 pi f hat sub b minus e to the minus j 2 pi f hat. So if I evaluate this frequency response at f hat sub b, in other words, I replace f hat by f hat sub b, then I have a difference here which is exactly equal to zero. So this system will block input frequencies at f hat sub b. Now a little change and we can block frequencies at minus f hat b. Let's suppose I have a second system whose output y of n is e to the j 2 pi f hat b times w of n minus w of n minus 1. Now I could consider this as a separate system, but ultimately what we're going to do is put these two systems in cascade. So I've allowed my output of the first system to be the input of the second system. Well, using the same procedure to find the frequency response of the second system, we apply an input e to the j 2 pi f hat n for w of n and solve for the frequency response as e to the j 2 pi f hat b minus e to the minus j 2 pi f hat. And in this case, if we replace f hat by minus f hat sub b, then we'll have a difference of zero and we have a system that blocks minus f hat of b. So we found a system that blocks f hat of b, another one that blocks minus f hat of b. If we do the cascade combination of these two systems, we will block both frequencies because at either f hat or minus f hat sub b, we'll have zero times some number. So the cascade combination, the frequency response is the product of the individual frequency responses. And I've just substituted for h1 of f hat and h2 of f hat on the right hand side. We can multiply these terms out and we find that we get 1 minus e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times the quantity e to the j 2 pi f hat b plus e to the minus j 2 pi f hat b plus e to the minus j 4 pi f hat b. Well, we recognize that this term in parentheses is just 2 times the cosine of 2 pi f hat b, so I can rewrite my frequency response as the form in light blue down here at the bottom. So this system will have exactly zero gain at f hat sub b and minus f hat sub b. We can identify the impulse response from picking off the coefficients of the frequency response. We have 1 in front of the e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times 0 term, in other words 1. We also have 1 times e to the minus j 4 pi f hat, which is the second term, the n equals 2 term. So h of n is 1 for n equals 0 and n equals 2. And then the n equals 1 term, which is associated with e to the minus j 2 pi f hat, is going to be minus 2 cosine 2 pi f hat b. This gives an equation for the relationship between the input and the output of this cascade, or the notch filter, as y of n is x of n minus 2 cosine 2 pi f hat b x of n minus 1 plus x of n minus 2. We can design a couple notch filters using this general form that we've found. Suppose we want to have our notch at 1 quarter cycles per sample. And when you plug in one quarter, we get cosine of 2 pi times 1 fourth is cosine of pi over 2, and that's exactly 0. So in this case, the middle term in our expression for the input and output, as well as for the frequency response, is 0. So y of n is x of n plus x of n minus 2, and that gives us h of f hat as 1 plus e to the minus j 4 pi f hat, which can be written in a slightly easier to visualize form by factoring out one half of this exponent from both terms and we have e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times cosine 2 pi f hat if we pull out a 2 as well. And we see that the frequency response magnitude indeed goes to 0 at f hat equals 1 fourth so we are zeroing out any input signal that has a component at one fourth. For a second example, suppose I want to have zero gain to frequencies one third cycles per sample. Substituting for f hat sub b to be one third, 
I find that cosine of 2 pi over 3 becomes minus a half, and therefore this second term, minus 2 times cosine 2 pi f hat b, is plus 1. So y of n is x of n plus x of n minus 1 plus x of n minus 2. We can solve for the frequency response, h of f hat. I've graphed the frequency response in purple here, and you see that we indeed have zero gain at one-third cycles per sample. We have a gain of three at the origin and a gain of one at one-half cycle per sample. So while this sort of notch filter design allows you to zero out any frequency that you desire, it doesn't ensure uniform gain at other frequencies. And that's where more sophisticated filter designs are useful.